Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. If you have your Bibles, open up to Acts 27. I will also have it on the screen for us. We are back in the book of Acts. We have two chapters left, this one and, and Acts 28. And I want to talk to you today and preach to you today how to lead through storms. We left off with Paul giving his defense to multiple leaders and being sent to Rome for a hearing before Caesar. And Paul was defending his own innocence, but also preaching the gospel in front of these leaders. And Luke goes into lengthy detail of this journey to Rome, uh, a voyage by boat. And it's not an easy one. There's gonna be a storm in our story today. There's gonna be a shipwreck as well. But in this story, we see God's sovereignty and God's protection in the middle of this voyage. We see God's faithfulness. We also see that in a storm, believers can be leaders, amen? amen. That even though things get hard, you can help those around you who are going through storms as well. And I wanna encourage you today to consider how you can be a leader to help other people go through things in their lives. And we're gonna learn from Paul's testimony, Paul's life here, and God's faithfulness, how this is possible. So Acts 27, and I wanna just give you a heads up uh, that there are a lot of interesting places to try to say. Uh, some really, really hard, difficult words to pronounce. So your grace, throw it up here real quick. <clears throat> some challenging words, and so I'll do my best. All right, Acts chapter 27, verse one. When the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was Adram Adramidium on the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province. You might be wondering who is we. Again, our author is actually Luke, the doctor, who later became a convert because of the disciples' ministry. And so Luke was on this voyage with Paul and that's why he's able to accurately detail everywhere they went. The next day, verse three, when we docked at Sidon, Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. Putting out to sea from there, we encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. So we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland. Keeping to the open sea, we pass along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, landing at Myra in the province of Lycia. See, see what I mean? That's a lot of, some challenging words to pronounce. There the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy and he put us on board. Let me show you real quick a map of where we're at because could be getting lost a little bit and a little geography um, reminder for us. So Paul was leaving Caesarea near Palestine there on the right where Israel and Jerusalem is. Then he goes up to Sidon and he goes around Cyprus and then they stop at Myra here where they get on a boat that's a grain boat that can um, hold 270 some people on it. So this is a big ship and it's not even the biggest in the fleet at this time for Rome. So this is a massive ship and they get on this one to head all the way up to Rome hopefully, and, and get there. And we, we see now that we're gonna see, it gets pretty hard. The voyage gets difficult. And uh, Paul helps lead the way in the middle of that voyage. So let's go back into our scripture here. Uh, verse seven, it says, we had several days of slow sailing and after great difficulty, we finally neared Nidus, but the wind was against us. So we sailed across the Crete and along the sheltered coast of the island, past the Cape of Salome or Salmoni. We struggled along the coast with great difficulty and finally arrived at Fair Havens near the town of Lassia. We had lost a lot of time. 
the weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall, and Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we, go on sh- if we go on, shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. And that's fair, right? Paul's not the captain of this ship, and, you know, but what they don't know is that this isn't Paul's first voyage. Actually, uh, 2 Corinthians 11.25 says this, three times, this is Paul writing a testimony about his persecution, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. He's actually writing about this trip on that. So this is the third time he'd be shipwrecked in our chapter today and he was floating at sea day and night. So this was a very difficult time for him. And so when he wrote 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, it was after this event. So Paul has experience and he knows more than they realize. He offers his advice, they don't take it, it's okay. Verse 12, and since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only southwest and northwest exposure. Now, obviously, it's about the location so they can get in and out with the ship. But, you know, I'm reading this as a person today, and I'm thinking, you know when you travel up or you travel around the United States and you want the best rest stop? Like, you want the one with Cracker Barrel? (laughs) You know, not the one with the gas station food, but you want a good stop, you know? So obviously this is more about what was best for the ship and, but maybe they had better accommodations. So they actually wanted to go further and because they wanted to go further, they run into some issues. And verse 13 says this, when a light wind began blowing from the South, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete, but the weather changed abruptly and a wind, a, a wind of typhoon strength called a Northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. And just so you know, gale force winds can be anywhere between 45 or 40 to 75 miles per hour. And that's just not fun on the sea. If anyone's ever been on a boat, you can get seasick, right? And that's just gonna be the least of their worries here. Verse 16 says, we sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Calda, where with great difficulty, we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being uh, towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across to the sandbars of Syrtis off the African coast. So they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they took uh, some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. This is bad. No stars, no sun. How do you navigate? It's just not going well. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. He had a, I told you so moment. Don't you love when you get those? But he rounds that out with grace and says, you would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives. This is a bold statement, but he gets it for a reason. He says this for a reason because he gets something from God. Even though the ship will go down, none of you will lose your lives. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. How many need an angel to stand beside you right now? Amen. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. Oh, shucks, I was hoping I could get out of that, you know. (laughs) But that was God's plan to bring him there so he could preach the gospel to these leaders. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. Now that's powerful. Let's just stop for a moment here because in a storm that we're seeing here, you think there'd be a loss of life of some sort, but God is so powerful, no one's gonna be lost. Everyone's going to be saved. And it would be a testimony of God's greatness. 
Verse 25 says, so take courage, so be encouraged. For I believe God, it will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. So this is a specific word from the Lord through an angel to Paul, and he uses this to encourage the men. About midnight on the 14th night, say 14th. You all, that's a long time. 14 nights in this storm. That's crazy. 14 nights being driven across the Sea of Adria or the Adriatic Sea, the sailors sensed land was near. They dropped a weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. So you can see they're getting closer to land. And at this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out um, anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. God's promise to protect them was very specific. And it was, you got to stay on the boat. You stay in his will, you're good to go. You go outside of God's will, things are going to happen. That's a lesson isn't it, in itself, isn't it? Stay in God's will, follow his word, things are going to be okay. It's going to get rough, but things will be okay. Go do your own way, things won't go that, the way it should. Verse 33 says, just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat, all 276 of us who were on board. That's a lot of people. And after eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. Let me just pause for a moment. Some people have read into this a little too much and said that, uh, Paul did communion with these men uh, and maybe women on board. He did not. Um, this was basically a Jewish custom. Before you break bread and eat, you thank God. So you pray and you thank God for your food. That's why we do it today. And so they, he prayed, he brought food. And he, he actually, to be honest with you, this was very wise as a person who's leading through a storm. If you know, if you know about surviving, you need calories to have strength to do anything. If you have a deficit of calories that's too great, your body can cramp up, you won't be able to have the strength to do things. And so he's saying, you need to eat because we're, we're probably gonna have to swim. If you don't have enough calories in your body, you're not gonna be able to make it if you're swimming in a storm. So he's like, we need to eat. But what he does is still spiritual in my opinion because he's, he gives thanks to God in the middle of a storm. Can we, can we tie that today? Can we thank God even when we're going through a storm? Amen. He's been faithful before. He'll be faithful again. Amen. And so what he was doing here is he was showing them that there's a God who's going to take care of us right now. Let's eat. Let's take care of ourselves. Let's, let's have some food and we're going to be okay. God's going to take care of us. What he did was he brought God in the middle of a storm to all these people that didn't know God the way he did. Amen. You can do the same thing, my friends. You can do the same thing. All right. Verse 39 says, we're almost done reading the scripture here. When morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors and left them in the sea. Then they lowered the rudders, raised the foresail and headed towards shore. But they hit a shoal and ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the ship stuck fast while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land. The others held on to planks and debris from the broken ship so everyone escaped safely to shore. Wow, praise God. Let me show you the map one more time to show you where things went bad here and the ship fell apart. We're gonna see here that white square where it says Paul's ship lost in a storm. 
And just to the left is a little island called Malta. So around that time, in the middle of that big open sea, in this area, they actually began to have problems and they got closer to Malta and that's where they land. The rest of our journey is next week in our chapter. So they're in this little island on the left, bottom left there called Malta. And that's where they floated in or swam in. Not that far away. They were obviously closer, but that is the journey. And they all made it alive. Only God can do something like that. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to talk to us just about that we're going to have storms in life, my friends, and we're going to go through them, but as believers and as Christians, we can actually lead through them too. We can be like Paul in this situation. And so I want to give four things that I've observed from the scripture and just know in general as well to help us. And the first one is this, number one, Get to know God while life is good so you know God's presence when life is hard. What am I saying here? I'm saying is when you're, on the, when you're in the harbor or when you're on land, make sure you're in the word of God and you have a relationship with the Lord. Get to know his presence. Get to know him well. Be close to God because when things get hard, you're gonna know how close he is to you. You're gonna know he's close to you. I've been through some seasons in my life where I have felt and I've seen God show up when I needed him to show up in the middle of a storm. Maybe you've been there too, where you've been praying or reading the word or you've been in church and all of a sudden the hairs on the back of your head stand up and it's not a scary thing, but it's the presence of the Lord with you in that moment. Maybe you've had a a song that God used to speak to you or scripture that spoke to you and God showed up. And the reason why is because you were already being with the Lord and so you recognize the Lord was with you and things got rough. And what good leaders do is they are always prepared for any storm. Good leaders actually are not waiting for things to get bad to go through the plans of how to get through it. They already know how to get through storms because they know God, amen? Amen. Psalm 89.9 says this, And this is about God. And if we know God, we'll know that he's with us. Psalm 89.9 says, you rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Or what about Psalm 107.23? I love this scripture. It actually has to do with a literal storm, but I also can say that God can do this emotionally and spiritually for you as well. Verse 23 says, some went off to sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were there and were at their wits end. Lord help, they cried in their trouble and he saved them from distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor, amen? Amen. God does that for us. God is over everything in the world. He also is over our storms. He is there to get you through, Amen? amen? One of the verses I hold on to is Psalm 46, one. And it's interesting how many people have sent this to me. Also another one in Isaiah about God's mighty strong hand that holds us. But Psalm 46, one says, God is our refuge and strength in ever present help in trouble. See, when I know God in the peaceful calm times, I'll know God is close in the hard times. And just because storms get bad and things go bad, it doesn't mean God's not there. So as you read, as you spend time with the Lord, you're learning and reminding your heart and mind, your soul, that he is with you the entire time. Secondly, the reason why Paul was able to lead through the storm is because he expects adversity 
and he's willing to go through it rather than around it. And I wanna encourage you to expect adversity and be willing to go through it rather than go around it and try to avoid it. I didn't get as many amens last service either on that one. (laughs) I get it, yeah. We live in a fantasy world if we think life is gonna be smooth sailing till the day we die. And maybe the American dream has contributed to this false security that we're supposed to live in a comfortable bubble and everything's good and nothing bad's gonna happen and we get to have ice cream every day (laughs) unless the McDonald's machine's broken again. (laughs) Which is often. I don't know that from personal experience. I promise. A friend told me. <laughs> but, but seriously, it, it, we, don't, we do, don't we live in a society where everything is supposed to go great, nothing bad is supposed to happen, but that's not the reality. And Paul expected this to happen. It was fall time. You're going to travel in the winter. The seas were bad during the fall and the winter. He knew this was going to be an issue. He has sailed before. He has been shipwrecked before. He was trying to tell them. He could, even, he could literally expect adversity. But you know what? We shouldn't be surprised when adversity comes. But you know why I'm comforted? Because God's never surprised when adversity comes. He knows all things and he sees it before it happens. But Jesus told us this. He told his disciples before he went to the cross... He was talking to them about how he's gonna send his Holy Spirit to be their comforter and counselor and stand by, their guide. And before he went, he wanted to make sure they know that. And in John 16, 33 says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Like hard times are coming, but I want you to still have peace because here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And anyone who trusts in Christ overcomes this world literally and we inherit eternal life. But we also overcome our trials that are temporary on earth because Jesus is with us. He is in the middle of the boat. Jesus walks on water. Amen. Jesus walks on water. So he's gonna help us rise above and get over the storm as well. Whatever we may be going through, whatever people are going through, I'm trying to give us confidence today that we can go through storms, but at the same time, help other people around us going through them too. Yeah, amen. You probably heard this quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt before. A smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. I want a Paul on my boat or my ship. He knows some things. And it's true, isn't it? And maybe we need to redeem some of the trials we've been through and use them for good. Actually, we we should do that. When we go through hard times, what if we turn our perspective and said, I'm gonna turn this into an opportunity to grow in my faith in God and grow in my character and how I handle it. Because the reality is a lot of times when we go through difficult seasons, it actually reveals our faith and where it is. And so, you know, sometimes when we go through a hard time, it seems like our faith has been shipwrecked. And you know what? I'm not condemning. I'm not I'm trying to, you know, judge you for that or anything like that. You know what? You're still learning. But I just want to encourage you this. Your faith is not in man. Your faith is in God. Amen. Things might be hard, but you don't have to just wreck. Yeah. Look, the, he even says to them, you're going to, we're going to, we're going to crash. <laughs> This boat, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a shipwreck, but we're gonna be okay. We're gonna be all right. I, you know what's interesting is I, I learned this I, again this past week. It was a great reminder. Do you know what the middle of the Bible says? If you actually were to break down the Bible and cut it in half and go right in the middle, 594 chapters, I think, or 596 are before Psalm 118. And the same amount is on the other side of Psalm 118. And the middle verse of the entire Bible says this, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. Wow, praise God. 
That's the middle of, the, now I have a study Bible, so it doesn't look like it. But if you were to total up all the chapters in the Bible, the middle verse of the Bible, in the middle of God's word for all of us, it says, trust the Lord. That's why we need to be in our word. And by the way, we can expect adversity and get through it because we can trust the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right, thirdly, and going along with this, hold on to God's word and keep your integrity. So yes, I was saying, read the word. Now I'm saying, hold on to the word because things will get hard and maybe you're going through something that's challenging. In Romans 8.35, it's on the screen, but Paul says this in Romans 8.35 and 37. So if you're going through something, this is something you hold on to. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Paul asks. No. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Does that mean God doesn't love us if we're going through those things? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Amen. Praise the Lord. You see, when you keep God's word in your heart and mind and you hold on to God's word, you're able to keep your integrity when things get tough. And where we go for help and hope and adversity is key. My friends, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to go to God when things get hard. And I just want to put this out there today. Be careful. Be careful of all the other voices you know, some people are living in storms and they're trying to make you live in the storm with them. That's not your storm. And by the way, we don't let, we, as we help people, as we get into their storm, so to say, to help them get through it, don't let it get into you. You go help, but you don't let it affect you to the point that now you're in a storm. And so sometimes you gotta, you gotta pull back a little bit and get with the Lord and go, hmm, I'm letting this affect me. Now I'm having a a sad day all the time or I'm depressed or I'm struggling or I'm questioning God. You need to be careful, amen? Be careful with that, all right? And and, and just so you know, I'm gonna share some more points on that in a moment to help us. But where we go matters. And there's a lot of voices in our world telling you how to think and how to feel. no. No, you, you get to deny that because God tells you how to think and how to feel. God's word does that. So Paul's looking at his circumstances and he's not, he's not, going, he's not joining the crowd and going, we're doomed. He's not holding on to the stern going, ah, ah. Yeah, that felt awkward doing that, but it's true. I mean, that's, he's not panicking. He's, he's not going crazy. No, instead he's like, hey, you guys need to eat. Hey, we're gonna break some bread and pray. Hey, probably shouldn't go that way. I mean, he's leading the way. How cool is that? He's praying. He's giving thanks to God in the middle of it. You know why? Maybe he read Isaiah 26, three that says you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. If we keep our mind in on God, he gives us peace. And the reason why is because God will not be shaken. The boat will rock, but God is the anchor. God is the captain. He's at the helm of our lives. We're gonna be okay. And I say keep your integrity and really your wits about you. And I wanted to do like an Irish accent with that, but I don't wanna butcher it. (laughs) But it just seems like it needs to have like an Irish accent. Keep your wits about you, you know? Like... (laughs) Is that Scottish or is that Irish? I don't know. Like, for real, I was pretty good, right? I was pretty good, yes. Creative arts ministry, here I come. But think about it, like, sometimes when one bad thing happens, the sky is falling, right? And as leaders, we're gonna go through things even as leaders, but we need to keep our wits about us. We need to not panic. We need to not go crazy. We need to breathe, remember whose we are. See, Paul most likely remembered and was reminded by that angel 
that God has him. He's gonna get in safely to the harbor and not just him, but everyone else. But you know what else Paul does? He doesn't crumble and he gives practical advice. You know what he says? He says, eat. And I'm gonna be super practical here for a moment. When you're going through a difficult time, you should eat. It, it actually helps you. It gives fuel to your body. It helps you calm down sometimes. Sleep, we should sleep. Yes, you're like, but I can't sleep. I know, but you should. And I get it. When, you're, when, you, when it, like the storm is in your head, it's hard to sleep, right? Am I right? But what you do is you cast all your cares upon the Lord, right? And then you, you try to sleep, all right? And maybe don't have caffeine at 10 o'clock at night. It might help. No sugar, things like that, you know? Like you gotta be wise with yourself. You know what else helps get rid of stress and worry and fear? Exercising. Like they couldn't do that on this ship, I guess, but you know, they didn't need to. They were doing enough trying to survive. But what Paul was saying was, let's do the practical, let God do the supernatural. Amen. Let's do the natural and let God take care of the supernatural. Let's keep our wits about us and let's eat and let's be okay and let's let God take care of us because he said he would. But we gotta go on in life. We can't fall apart and crumble and not take care of our kids, take care of our family and all those things. And if you're gonna be a leader, you're definitely gonna be able to lead your family and even help other people around you. Amen. Now listen, there's grace for those times where we're the ones in the storm. I get it. That's been me. And I thank God for the church body. I thank God for my parents. I thank God for my wife, my kids, my family members, my friends who have been there for me. There are times where you have to acknowledge I'm the one in the storm and I, gotta, I, gotta, I need some help. You should do that. You should do that. And leaders can also go through storms too. And one of the best things we can do is admit that we're going through one and drop your pride and ask for help. Ask for prayer. And I'm preaching from my own experience and how I've not handled myself that way and I should have. And lastly, the obvious, and I've been saying it throughout this message, look for ways to help others get through their storms. You know what I noticed is that when you look outside of yourselves, your storm is smaller. Your cloud shrinks a little bit more. That darkness gets a little brighter because you're helping other people, it distracts you from your own struggle. And so there are gonna be times when we're going through it, but you know what? There are other people going through it, ready for this, without Jesus. Actually, that's America. Our, our, our nation needs Jesus. And when you see people falling apart, you know, at work or in their neighborhood or their marriages, their families, things like that, they're going through that without Jesus most of the time. And so we can show them how to go through our struggles and show them Christ in the middle of that. And they're gonna go, how do you, how do you even have strength? You, I heard about what happened to your family, yada, yada, yada. And you can tell them, because God has me. He's getting me safely to the harbor. He's in the middle of this storm with me. Amen. Amen. So leaders look out for others and not just themselves. And the other reason why too is because we know that God is at the helm. We can trust God with our lives as we help other people in theirs. Amen. Let me give you a couple of verses to consider. 2 Corinthians 1.4. He comforts us in all our troubles. This is what God does. God comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we would be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. There are people in this church and in this room right now who have endured cancer. Your strength, it's incredible. God's faithfulness is incredible through, your, through that whole story. Your testimony can help those around you, amen? Amen. Some of you have been through some dark seasons and tumultuous storms and God can use you to help others go through it. And I just wanna say thank you as a pastor who's, I'm only one person, I'm not Jesus, I'm not omnipresent, I can't be everywhere at all times, neither is our staff, 
when you're there for people, helping them get through storms, it means a lot to us. I just want to say, keep going. Keep going. Let your testimony help other people go through their tests. Amen? Amen. Let other people go through their trials. Let's give God glory and praise for that because he's helping us do that. Now, last verse here, Paul says this, and he kind of gets a little bold here, and he, he says, Galatians 6, 2 through 3, he says, share each other's burdens, or carry each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ, or as I read to Mike, you fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It's love. Love God, love others, love your neighbor as yourself. But then he goes on to say this, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. <laughs> oh, like, whoa, Paul, oh, okay. And like, I know that's not our heart. You know, I'm sure you want to help people, but I guess apparently there were some people at this time where they thought they were too good to help other people and let's not be like that. But I think sometimes we feel like our story or our testimony is not good enough either when it is because it shows the faithfulness of God. Amen. So don't be afraid to let God use you. So in closing, why don't we stand together as I wrap this up? If you can stand, stand with us. Pray you're encouraged today. You know what Paul was? Paul was a vessel for God to bring glory to God and to show his goodness and his faithfulness, his power, his sovereignty, all these things to show the character of God in the middle of a storm. And you know, I just wanna encourage you to think outwardly with your story of, of your storm. I believe that God is wanting to show his glory to those around us as we go through ours and have our own story. God isn't using you like, you know, like using you. He's utilizing your story to reach people. And I just want you to know, like, he sees what you're going through and he's there and you can trust him. And to consider those around you and rise above the storm, walk on water, so to say, metaphorically speaking, whatever you're going through, walk on top of your storm and help other people through it. And so I don't know how you can apply that. Maybe your whole family is going through something. Maybe some people at your workplace is going through something. But I know this, that you can walk above it because God has you. He's holding you. He's taking care of you. And look for ways to shine and to bring peace in the middle of the storm because that's what God did with Paul. Do you know that everyone made it safe to harbor and next week, we're going to learn how God continues to use the life of Paul to help bring awareness to who God is and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. People don't have Jesus, and they're going through storms. We do. With your eyes closed, your heads bowed, just to posture of prayer and meditation here. We sang some songs today. And one of them talks about the blood of Jesus Christ. The reason why we sing that song is because in the Old Testament, God saved and God gave grace and God gave forgiveness and mercy and righteousness through the sacrifice of these animals and their blood. As we get into the New Testament, Jesus is called the Lamb of God and he's sacrificed on the cross and his blood poured out, if applied to your life, if believed, saves you. And also delivers you even from other things, not just from sin and death, but can help you. And Hebrews talks about how all the animals was never able to get rid of the stain of sin, but one person, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was able to fix everything. And because of that, not that we're not going to have difficult times, because Jesus said we would, but because of that, people have peace between God and themselves. They have a relationship with him, and they can have peace when things are hard. If you're in this room, 
and you don't have peace, I'm gonna make it really simple here. You need Jesus. You know, sin can make us feel like we're not at peace with God. And you know why? We're not. We're not. And so if you've never believed in Jesus Christ to apply the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, you won't feel at peace. All these trials that you're going through is nothing, is not gonna help. The only thing that's gonna help most of all is that inner peace that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That he loves you, he forgives you. You know, he loved you while you were still a sinner. We heard that today. How much more is he gonna love you when you're saved? And by the way, he just loves you even... He loves you the same. You just discover more of his love as you walk with him. And so today, the most important need you have is the forgiveness of sin. And so if you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you hold a hand up today and say, I need Jesus today as my Lord and Savior. Just hold your hand up because we're gonna pray together. I just need to know who I'm talking with and praying with. Amen, I'm seeing hands. Yeah, praise God. Yeah, cool. Cool. And for those of you who feel rocked by things in your life and that you need the peace of God to be in your life, would you hold a hand up? Maybe it's you, maybe it's a family member, maybe your whole family's going through something. Just hold your hand up and keep it up because we're gonna do something if appropriately. I'm gonna have people around just put a hand on your shoulder to pray for you. So look up real quick, see those hands up? Can we just pray over them? They need encouragement today. They need the body of Christ to be there for them and we're gonna pray for them. So, all right, let's pray. And if you have given your life to Christ today, just pray with me on this. Lord, I thank you for your cross. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for the blood that covers over my sin. And Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Save me. Make me a new person. Give me your Holy Spirit, Lord, to follow you and to follow your will. I give you my life today to serve you and not serve myself, not serve sin, but serve you. I give you my life. And Lord, for the people in this room right now going through storms, for the people they're interceding for right now and praying for God, I pray, Lord, that your ever-present help will be felt today, that we will remember your word and your faithfulness to us We thank you, God, for being with us. And Lord, I pray they would feel your tangible presence, that God, you would reassure them of their future, your present help now, and remind them, God, you've been there since the past. You're gonna continue to be there. You've been there in the beginning. You're gonna continue to be there, and you're gonna fulfill all that you want to do, God. Lord, I pray for a supernatural peace and comfort. You know the exact situation. Lord, heal bodies where healing needs to take place. Lord, heal brokenness where brokenness is prevalent. Lord, where there is worry, I pray, God, you would give peace. And that, Lord, we would keep our mind on you who keeps us in perfect peace. We love you, God, and we thank you in the middle of our storms. And we remember we've been through them before. We'll get through them again. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.